today to be joined by not one, but two special guest presenters, especially being um, Plastic Free July. It's a great way to start um, thinking about what we can do and celebrating Plastic Free July, which I know you guys, you will already do things um, to help, but you can always do a little bit more. Um, me here with my reusable cup with my hot chocolate. There we go. Working well. Um, but we are going to have Pam uh, present first, and we're really lucky to have Mathilde join us for the whole time. So you're going to see her down here. Um, Mathilde is from Tangaroa Blue. She'll be joining us after Pam finishes speaking. So we'll get the chance to chat to her later. Now, Mathilde is on a boat, so if you see her fall over randomly, um, it's all okay. Don't worry about her too much. She's just enjoying cruising. Um, but we'll hand over to Pham now. Now, Pham is from Port Phillip Eco Centre. Um, she's going to be talking to us about some of the work that she's been doing around Port Phillip Bay, um, really local to us at the moment as well. Um, and as I said, if you've got any questions as you think of them, pop them down the bottom and we'll open it up for questions and answers at the end. But I might hand over to you now, Pham, if you're ready. Yeah, sure thing. And uh, also, okay. please do prompt me when I have five minutes left because I just keep talking about plastic. <laughs> Sounds like a really unsexy subject, but once you get into it, there's a lot to talk about. So please do prompt me and tell me when I have five minutes left. And now I'll perfect. Uh, we can up. do that. <laughs> yeah, I need a timekeeper. Um, <laughs> Love it. Okay, so what I'll do is first of all, thanks everyone for uh, turning up so early on a Saturday morning um, to to hear us uh, speak. I'm very honoured be here and to be invited by, um, by Peter and uh, Tiana uh, to speak with you today. Uh, so I'm going to talk about a particular project that I'm, uh, that I'm running for the Port Phillip Eco Center at the moment. So I'm just going to share my screen um, as I have a little PowerPoint prepared. Do, do, do. Here we are. Great. So are you guys all seeing my screen right now? Yeah, all right, good, get a thumbs up, that's good. Um, so the project that I wanted to talk to you guys about is Clean Bay Blueprint, which is a, uh, an, a litter research, plastic pollution research project that I've been running um, that's sponsored by the Victorian government. And I've been doing this for five and a half years now. Um, and we're just getting to the end of the, of the project now. So I'm in the reporting phase. Um, so I just wanted to tell you guys a little bit about what we've been doing at the Port Phillip Eco Center in this space. Uh, so before I start, the Port Phillip Eco Centre is uh, a community-run, not-for-profit organisation. We are based in St Kilda, in the St Kilda Botanic Gardens. At the moment, everybody's working from home, obviously, uh, but in normal times, uh, that's where we are. And what we do is um, we help, we're environmental, an environmental not-for-profit, and we concentrate on the health of Port Phillip Bay and also the waterways. Uh, in Victoria that lead into Port Phillip Bay. So that's kind of the focus that we have as an environmental organization. Um, so we also help people reconnect with nature and the natural systems around them, uh, specifically urban nature as well. And uh, we do that through uh, community programs that we run. Uh, so I lead citizen science programs for the Eco Center as well. And I work with a lot of volunteers. And then we also have a fantastic education team uh, who work with uh, schools from over 185 schools from all over Victoria that come and do excursions with us at the Eco Center or on the beach um, and engage in our online forums at the moment. And sometimes we also go into the schools and work with them on things like energy efficiency and uh, sustainability leadership, that kind of, those kinds of programs as well. So we do a lot of, a lot of education um, for the environment. So that's us um, at the Eco Center. Uh, so a little bit about me. So my name is Bum. Uh, you can hear from my accent that I'm not Australian. I'm originally from the Netherlands and uh, I came here ooh, nearly 10 years ago now. Uh, I studied marine biology uh, because when I was younger, I always had so many questions about the natural world that I was driving my mom pretty crazy. Always asking like, oh, why is this? Why does that happen? Why is that bird flying there? Why is this fish swimming there? So my mom said, yeah, maybe you should get into science so you can learn how to answer your own questions and stop bothering me. Uh, so that's exactly what I did. And uh, I started with a bachelor in biology, uh, which I then specialized in, in ecology because I like, um, I really like looking at the relationships between different species in the environment, in ecosystems, and also the relationships that humans have to these systems and other species as well. Uh, and then I did a master after that in uh, specializing in marine biology and nature conservation. Um, so that's kind of like the, the, the track that I took to, uh, 
to become a marine biologist for the Eco Center. So as you can see on the photo here with my super serious face on, uh, this is me doing my research. Uh, I am on the Yarra River here on the boat uh, that's owned by the Yarra River Keeper. Uh, they are project partners in this project for us. And um, you see that you can see that I've got a giant net there. Uh, that's called a manta net, and I've just been trawling that uh, behind the boat. And <clears throat> I have taken off this uh, this kind of like sock-like um, contraption in my hand, and you can see there's all kinds of stuff in there, a mix of organic materials and plastic pollution that I've just fished out of the river. So I'll tell you a little bit more about that research. Um, another thing that I do is uh, I'm a co-host on Radio Marinara, which is a program about all things wet and salty about oceans on Triple uh, R Community Radio every Sunday from 9 a.m. till 10 a.m. So yeah, if you feel like getting up early again in your school holidays, then <laughs> tune in to uh, uh, 102, uh, 1, 107.2, sorry, 102.7. Uh, FM and uh, and listen to uh, ocean programs um, there. So that's that's the thing I do on the side. Uh, but hands down, the favorite part of my job uh, is that I get to work with fantastic people, uh, not just my colleagues at the Eco Center, but especially people from the community, students like yourselves who are passionate about ocean conservation. And in this photo that you see down here, these are my volunteers that are have been collaborating with me on a project, a three-year project, where we've been taking water samples in Port Phillip Bay uh, to check for uh, a potentially uh, very dangerous sunscreen chemicals that might have a detrimental effect on the wildlife in the bay, which is a, a project that's run by RMIT. And I was doing the, um, the data collection through citizen science. And so these are fantastic volunteers that give up their spare time to um, help me with these projects because they love the ocean just as much as you do and as we do. So that's definitely the favorite part of my job. Um, so that was a little bit about me. Um, so before we dive into kind of the results of the research, uh, I'd like to just sketch a little bit um, about the global issues with plastic and then we'll take it a little bit more local into Melbourne as well. So. You know, you may or may already may or may not know this already, but plastics having plastic pollution in the environment is a huge issue. So you can see on this picture over here that how the plastic gets into the waterways and what happens to it after that. So what happens is that it breaks up into smaller and smaller pieces under the influence of UV radiation from the sun and also being bashed around on rocks and things like that. Uh, and some of that will sink down and get into the sediments or into the, the, the bottom of the ocean where it's being eaten by crabs and all kinds of creatures that live there. And some of it will float in the water column because pl some plastics are quite light. So they just kind of float around. And animals, they can't see the difference between a piece of food and a piece of plastic. So they will eat that. Uh, obviously, this is quite an issue because um, they could get entangled in plastic pollution, you may have seen like horrible photos of, you know, sea turtles with like straws up their noses or uh, sea lions with fishing line around their necks and things like that. So that happens. But also what happens is that they'll ingest it um, uh, with all of the toxins that are in that getting into their tissues. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. So just to put things into context, plastics are not just an issue directly for wildlife or the oceans, it is actually climate change related as well. Because 99% of plastics are made with um, chemicals that come from fossil fuels, right? And because we are moving, kind of like moving towards a transition of having more renewable energy in the world, it does mean that the plastic industry is still very reliant on those fossil fuels to make their plastic. And so they, they're kind of keeping the, plast uh, the, the fossil fuels alive in that sense. So they're working against uh, what we're trying to do, which is ha having a carbon, carbon neutral society and uh, being more sustainable. Um, yeah, so pl having plastics and producing plastics is, is not great for climate change. It works really hard against that. Um, also, the plastics industry worldwide has set their goals to triple their plastic produce pollution by 2030. And if you have seen any documentaries or pictures about how much plastic there is already in the ocean, uh, that is not a good thing, obviously. And we need to really start taking steps to move away from that and, and um, move away from our plastic use. 
Um, the crazy stuff about single-use plastics, I don't know if you guys have ever thought about it, but this always boggles my mind, right? So plastics are made from fossil fuels and fossil fuels are oil and oil comes out of the ground. It's basically dinosaur juice, right? So it's all these layers of organic material that have been squashed by layers of the earth for hundreds of millions of years to become oil. That then gets pumped up out of the earth. It gets transported to a petrochemical factory where all kinds of chemical additives are added to make the base material for plastics. Then it goes to a plastics factory where it is injection molded into the particular shape of an item that you want to buy, right? Like for example, a plastic water bottle. Then it gets transported again to the retailers that are selling you this plastic water bottle. Then you get really thirsty. You go into the shop and you buy this plastic water bottle. You drink it, right? And the average piece of single use plastic is only used for 12 seconds. And then you throw it away, whether it be in the recycling bin or the landfill, or it might get lost in the environment. And that plastic is then going to last in the environment forever, forever. So every piece of plastic that has ever been produced since the start of the 1900s is still somewhere on this earth, whether it be on the bottom of the ocean or in a landfill somewhere or anywhere in between, just so that we can use it for 12 seconds. Now that just seems like a crazy thing to me. I don't know about you guys, but yeah, that just boggles my mind. Um, and that lasting forever in the environment is a problem because what happens is plastic breaks up. It doesn't break down. Right? So the difference between that is that if a material breaks down, that is done by microbes and microorganisms that break down a particular organic material into the basic building blocks of life, such as phosphorus, nitrogen, carbon, oxygen. And once the uh, material is broken down into those pieces, it goes back into the food chain and it can be used by other creatures to make a skeleton, to eat, to you know, do all the other stuff that is the part of nature. With plastics, that doesn't happen. Because of the manufacturing process, sure, the plastic pieces get smaller and smaller, but microbes actually can't really eat them. And so it means that even though they get so small, they break up into such small pieces that you can't even see them under the microscope anymore, so small, they are still plastic molecules. They will never become nitrogen and carbon and phosphorus and all of those yummy things that other microbes then can eat. So this is how it lasts forever in the environment. And that is, that is a very big problem. So I talked a little bit about uh, the chemicals that uh, are added to the oil to make plastic um, to give it its properties. Now, this is quite toxic for wildlife. So when a fish, for example, is still a baby fish and it eats a piece of plastic, those chemicals, because they are soluble in oil, not water, will actually come off that piece of plastic and move into the, the fatty tissues of that fish's body. And over time, it means that those chemicals, the more that fish eats of those chemical plastics, the more of these chemicals are being stored in its body. And that is called bioaccumulation. And you can see that here over time, the bigger that fish grows, the more it eats, the more toxins it will accumulate, bioaccumulate in its tissues, um, which is obviously an issue, especially if we want to eat that fish, right? Then there's another pro process that happens, which is called biomagnification. So um, I'm assuming that you all heard about food chains before. Uh, so if you look all the way down in the right hand down corner, you see the plastics and the toxins. And those are being eaten by animal plankton. And those animal planktons are food for small fish. Now those animal plankton, if you have one plankton that eats a piece of plastic, it has like one unit of chemicals in its body. So, but when I go up in the food chain to the small fish level, one of those small fish might eat 10 planktons per day. So that means that fish already has 10 times the amount of toxins in its body than the plankton level of this food chain did, right? And so if we then go to the larger fish level, those larger fish might eat 10 of those small fish per day. And so that means 10 times 10 those larger fish have a hundred times the concentration of those toxins in their body after one day. And so you can see in this, in this yellow and red arrow that the toxin levels in these bodies of these animals are going up and they're being biomagnified as they move up the food chain. 
And I don't know about you guys, but I get a bit worried about that because I'm on top of that food chain because we love eating the top predators that are the fish like tuna, flake, you know, in the shape of sharks, um, like all kinds of like marlin or barracuda, whatever you want to eat. We, we tend to eat those top predators that have those toxins bioaccumulated in their body, uh, biomagnified in their bodies. Um, so that's how these plastics in the environment eventually come back to us. Because we are not separate as humans from the environment. We are very much a part of this. And this is, this is how, that, how that plays out in real life. So knowing all of this, um, I was very curious because I wanted to know how big the problem was in Port Phillip Bay of plastic pollution. And I was doing a lot of research and I couldn't find any data. And this is problematic because we know that we find plastic bags and all kinds of stuff uh, washing up on the beaches. You know, there's Beach Patrol, which is an organization that cleans up the beaches and they just, and Tangaro Blue, for example, as well, when they do beach cleanups, they count how many kilos of stuff they get. And it's pretty, it's pretty bad, right? So we wanted to change that with the government. We wanted to get tougher laws. Uh, we wanted to see some kind of legislation that would look after our bay much better than it is right now in, in terms of litter. But what happens when you want to create that kind of change, the first thing that a politician will ask you is like, well, you're saying we need to take action, but how big, how big is the problem? How big is it? Like, you know, I have a lot of other stuff to do and a lot of other things to concentrate on. Like, why should I act on this? So what we need is we need to use science to get the evidence that we need to underpin our advocacy efforts. And that's what we do at the Eco Center. So what we decided to do was to do a big research project over a number of years to quantify um, the, the number of items that would flow into Port Phillip Bay from the two big rivers in Melbourne, which is the Yarra River and the Maribyrnong River. Um, so, and we were also very curious to see what the microplastics problem was, because we know there are microplastics in the environment, which are small pieces of plastic, smaller than five millimeters in diameter. Um, and we wanted to know kind of like what the ratio was, right? Because we pick up plastic bottles and stuff from the beach, but the microplastics are the ones that are ingested by small creatures. So they're actually quite um, a threat. So we wanted to just see what is going on there. How much is there? And should we actually worry or are we worrying for nothing? So that is the research. Now, as you can see here, two of my colleagues are on the Yarra River Keeper boat. And behind this boat, you can see a long net that is basically being dragged behind the boat and it samples the first 20 centimeters of the water column. So it catches all the plastics and all the organic material um, as, we are, as we are moving the boat upriver. So here's a, a bit more of a, a, a detailed view. Um, so you can see the net is about three meters long um, and it catches all the stuff that floats on the surface. And at the end there, the end of the net, you can see like this little sock that I showed you in the first photo. That's where we catch all the plastics. So the water just goes out through the net and the plastics get stuck in there. So once we have that sample, this is where uh, my favorite people in the world come in who are volunteers and community members and students like yourselves uh, who help me with the analysis of this. So this is Emily. Uh, Emily is a school teacher and she's been volunteering with me for a long time. She uh, also runs Zero Waste Victoria, a very successful organization uh, that looks at also, you know, using less plastics. And Emily is separating the organic materials such as leaf litter and sticks and all kinds of organic stuff that we caught in a net. And she's separating that out from the plastic pollution. You can see a little, a little pile of plastic pollution on, on the left hand side of the photo, um, consisting of all kinds of different items. So the next step then is that we measure every bit so we know if it's a microplastic or not. And um, we put these items in different item classes. So we track things like hard plastic fragments, polystyrene, bottle caps, straws, that kind of thing. So we just get a bit of better idea about what kind of items are out there. So I'm going to hit you with a few uh, uh, um, stats here and a few results. Now, these results are still a little bit confidential. <laughs> so because I'm still working on the government report that is reporting on this. So you guys are getting the scoop here of the latest uh, research results. We have calculated that over the last five and a half years, averagely on an annual basis, 2.5 billion pieces of plastics reach Port Phillip Bay. And that's just from the Yarra and the Maribyrnong rivers from the top 20 centimeters. 
right? So that's not even counting all the stormwater drains that are coming out straight into the bay or the Patterson River or the Werribee River, right? So that is a staggering number of plastic um, on an annual basis, but it's still an underestimation of what is really happening there. Now we calculated from our research that 2 billion of those or 85% are microplastics. So they are those broken up pieces of plastic that are smaller than five millimeters in diameter and a potential hazard uh, for smaller wildlife that doesn't know the difference between that or a piece of food. And we also have found that because we've been doing it for five and a half years, we could see the changes over time as well. And we have calculated that the, program, the, the problem is getting worse over time. So every year we're seeing an increase in plastic pollution in the Yarra and the Maribyrnong um, and in Port Phillip Bay by default. But the good news is as well that we are seeing progress. Um, so as I told you before, we track different item classes and we are seeing that even though most of those item classes are getting worse in terms of more pollution every year, straws, plastic straws are on the decline. And that is really heartening for me because I've been working with communities around the Bay for many years now um, to reduce the use of plastic straws, right? And these community members, they are going out there, they're talking to their cafes and their retailers, and they're convincing them to replace plastic straws with paper ones. They're convincing their family and their friends to just refuse a straw when you buy a drink, right? And that effort is paying off. So after a few years, we are now seeing in the scientific data that people are starting to reduce their use of straws. And so even though all of the other categories are getting worse, plastic straws are on the decline. And this is amazing news because it means that if you make one change in your daily life and you get your friends and your family to do that too, and your classmates and everybody, that actually makes a real difference. And we now have science to prove that it is working. Right? Because if we didn't do this data collection, we would have never been able to prove it. Um, so it means that community efforts work and the changes that you make in your life personally in your plastic use, they work, even though you can't directly see it just yet. So, so that's, a very, that's very good news that has come out of this research. Um, now, how do we use these results to create the change we want to see? So we've done the research, but scientific research is only as useful as the results that are being used for actual change, right? We don't do the research for fun. Um, we use it for change. So we've, we've used our, this data and these results to help change the law. So we were instrumental in getting the ban on plastic bags. Uh, in 2018, we sat around the table with the state government and showed them the evidence, like this is a problem. Plastic bags are an issue. We need to do something about it. And also we helped, uh, we got uh, plastic listed uh, in the law that the Environment Protection Agency enforces to recognize plastic pollution and microplastics as a threat to waterways. And what that means is that if they put that as an official threat to waterways in their, in their policy, the state government policies, it means that they have to act on it and do something about it. And Because if it's not in the law, if it's not even mentioned, then no one's going to be caring about it in the government, right? So we made sure uh, that through our science and efforts and our evidence, that was listed as a threat to waterways. So now it holds the government accountable for acting on that as well and, um, and getting results in reducing litter in the environment. So those are two examples of how this very practical citizen science research can actually create lasting change. Um, obviously, we also use this science to educate people, right? Like you guys, for example, you are very keen to learn all about the oceans and how you can get involved and how you can help protect them. So we create, we use the scientific evidence to help educate you guys uh, and, and, and help you understand what is happening in the oceans and where we need to take action and how we need to take action on that. So science helps with that. Uh, and also we use it to help people change their behavior. Right. So if you know that refusing a straw is actually working, even though you can't see it directly, but we're using the scientific results to show you that small changes you make are actually helping the environment. That's a massive thing. Right. Like it helps you change your behavior. It helps you uh, stay motivated to keep working towards these changes we want to see for the environment. So what can you do to help in your personal life? Um, 
for me, with single-use plastics, it's basically, if you don't use it, you also can't lose it, right? So we use plastic all the time and about, somebody made this calculation, I don't know how true it is still, but somebody made this calculation that it's an estimate that about 10% of the plastic, single-use plastics in packaging that's being used in general in the population, about 10% of that is lost as litter and ends up in the environment and therefore in the oceans. 10%, that's a lot, right? Because we have 5 million people in Melbourne and everybody uses plastic. So that is a lot. So the first step, if you want to help, is to reduce your plastic use. Because if you don't use it, you can't lose it either, right? Um, so I always tell people, you know, see what you can do in your local area. You know, start volunteering. Um, there's some, if you live near uh, Port Phillip Bay, for example, there's Beach Patrol, an organization that uh, once a month they get together and they clean up a particular beach in their postcode. You know, so they're volunteering together, they're learning from each other and they're doing some practical action there. Um, but if you don't live near a beach, you can still do so many things. Like what can you do at your school? Right? Can you, for example, uh, join your green team, your sustainability team at school, if you have one? If you don't have one, can you start one and look at how your school is dealing with recycling and plastic? Um, or is it as simple as uh, cleaning up your schoolyard and just doing it, you know, like getting together with your class and removing all of the plastic lolly wrappers and things like that from your schoolyard so it doesn't blow into the nearest stormwater drains and gets into the bay? So there are things that you can do at home, no matter where you are in the suburbs, um, that you can do to help out with this issue. And same thing, what can you do in your neighborhood? You know, are there any uh, creeks near your place that could use a cleanup? Or are there any community environment groups already active that you might be able to join and support in their advocacy efforts? So there are lots of ways for you guys to get involved. Um, but the thing that you always have control over is how much plastic you use yourself. Right? That is something that we can control. We can't really personally control how much the plastic factories in the world are producing right now. That's a systemic change that we're working towards changing, but it's a very slow process, right? So that's not something we have direct control over. What you have direct control over, though, is yourself and your own behavior. So if you want to change something, for example, refuse plastic straws from now on, that is something that's within your power to do. And you can pick up that power and use that, right? So I can really recommend joining plastic, the Plastic Free July Challenge. Uh, we're now a few days in already, but it is super fun. Uh, if you go to the website, plasticfreejuly.org, you can read all about it. It's basically a challenge for the month of July. To try and avoid using, buying any single use plastic packaging. It's quite a challenge. That's why it's called the Plastic Free July Challenge, but it's super fun to do. And it actually teaches you a lot about how we use plastic and what areas of our lives we use plastic in as well. It's very educational for yourself. Um, and it's also a super fun challenge to do with friends uh, or even with your school, with your class, if you're so inclined, or with your family. Um, it's really quite eye-opening to see how pervasive plastic is in our lives. Uh, and also to then um, find out how we can take steps to avoid getting that plastic in our lives as well. So I won't take up any more um, of that time because I could talk about this forever, uh, but have a look at plasticfreejuly.org. Uh, maybe the follow-up email can have a link in there or something like that. I'll leave that up to Peter and Tiana um, and, and have a look at uh, what you can do in your daily life to, to avoid using these, this plastic. Um, yeah, so I really thank you guys for turning up and, and, and listening to this talk. And I, I really hope that you guys got something out of it. Um, and I'm always happy to answer any questions. So I think we can move into that now. You want to do the Q&A now? Amazing. Thank you, fam. That was so good. I was sitting here eating my hot chocolate or drinking my hot chocolate while listening as well. I was actually <laughs> talking to everyone on my table about what you were saying about bioaccumulation. I was like, guys, do you know what bioaccumulation is? No idea. So it just goes to show that you do have to educate 
um, your community and it's so easy it's just a conversation it's not about pushing your ideas on anyone it's about fun things like the plastic free July challenge um, to try and get people involved so thank you so much for that it was so interesting um, to see all that work that you guys have been doing even if it is confidential we'll keep it to <laughs> I all promise the, all of the results are so you guys are getting the scoop here <laughs> even before the state government does <laughs> we're spoiled we're so lucky now there was quite a few questions on the chat wasn't there Tiana which was great to see can yeah. you see those um chat questions there maybe to ask fam yeah so the first one ava's got quite a few today so ava's yes. first one yeah good questions as well yeah uh, what do the toxins actually do to the fish's physical body how does it harm them yeah so uh so the the chemical toxins there's lots of different ones because plastic uh, as you know, plastic is not just one type of plastic, right? Because you have like water bottles that are like a little bit squidgy, but still quite hard. And then you have plastic bags, which are super squidgy and, and you can scrunch them up. So to make plastic in all of those different forms, petrochemical factories need to add different chemicals to that to make it soft or to make it stiff or to make sure that it doesn't shatter when you squeeze it, you know? So all of these things have different chemicals. Now, the chemicals in it that are some of the more harmful ones are PCBs. Um, and the, so this is an example. And PCBs, they make plastic soft. So it makes it soft and squidgy. So that's why they are added. Now, the problem with PCBs is that on a molecular level, when you look at the molecular structure of a PCB molecule, it looks very much like a reproductive hormone that animals have in their bodies. So oh. what happens is if they accumulate, bioaccumulate a lot of those plastic toxins, and this goes for top predators mostly, then their body mistakes those molecules, PCB molecules for hormones, and it can actually mess with their reproduction. So what wow. we are seeing at the moment in uh, Northern Europe, where I'm from, uh, off the coast of the UK, there have been resident pods of killer whales, orcas, that have lived there for many generations. They've been studied for more than 30 years by resident marine biologists there. And what happens is that they were wondering why the females, the young females, were not reproducing anymore. And so they took blood samples and they measured PCB levels of toxins in the blood of these animals that was like something like a hundred or a thousand times the healthy amount of PCB. So these chemicals, because they bioaccumulate in those bodies of these animals because they're top predators, are actually stopping them for reproduce, from reproducing. And so that means that these pod of orcas will die out forever within a generation because they can't have babies, right? So that is one example of how those toxins mess yeah. with the systems of, of, um, of animals. And don't forget, we are mammals too. We are animals too. We use the same hormones in our bodies that other animals do. So it is also uh, a problem for human health, right? So we should not forget that because we are the top predators just as much as the orcas are. Yeah. Um, so that is, that is an, an example. And another example is that when plastic particles float around in the water column, they're floating around, right? Because they are made of oil and toxins are oil soluble, it means that toxins that are already floating in the water by themselves tend to absorb into these plastic bits that are floating around. So that means pesticides that are used in agriculture, artificial fertilizers that wash off from agriculture into the oceans. So they all accumulate and grab onto this plastic piece so when a fish eats that, it doesn't only get the, the chemicals that are mm. made in the plastic, but also the toxins and heavy metals, mercury, cadmium, that sort of thing, that are attached to those plastics from that used to be floating around in the water, right? So we're getting a hell of a lot more toxins in our body uh, than we're bargaining for when we, when we get yeah. those kinds of plastics in the food chain. Yeah, so you, I hope that... You don't always think of those sort of things do you fam like the fact that you know orcas are eating you know those top level predators as well and yeah. how much they're getting in their system that's just crazy yeah yeah, yeah. and and that that happens over time you know so yeah, yeah. 
Bits yeah, so let's, let's, let's take good, another good. question. <laughs> a good reason to do Plastic Free July and try and carry it throughout the year. Um, Ava actually had another really interesting question um, and one that I think a few people have asked me in my time at the aquarium as well. Um, it was, can you actually ingest plastic toxins through a plastic water bottle, especially one that may have been sitting in the sun? Now we um, can yeah, we? Yeah, you can. Um, mm -hmm. and, and so, um, so this is why a lot of, uh, bottle manufacturers now, so when you buy a, a, re, a reusable water bottle, when it's made of plastic, often it has a sticker on it that says BPA free. Mm -hmm. so the BPAs are those toxins that, uh, are, are embedded in the plastic. They're made, you know, made with these toxins, uh, that can actually get into your, into your bloodstream as you're drinking the water. So yes. Um, so this is a really, it's a bit of a touchy subject because if you put like microwave, a microwave dish made of plastic in the microwave with your food in it, is mm. it going to have toxins in your food? The answer is probably yes. But what we also calculate is, uh, there is always like what people call an acceptable level of toxicity that you can have in your blood. So you, your body can actually handle a particular concentration of chemicals in your, in your body, um, before you start getting sick or getting symptoms of, 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 of mm -hmm. Now, obviously, um, there are the World Health Organization and science, you know, all kinds of other scientific uh, organizations will set those levels to, you know, what, what's healthy and what's not healthy. However, um, we are exposed to so many toxins in our environment. Like uh, if I ride my bike through the CBD and I'm breathing in all of the, you know, the, 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 the trucks exhaust and things like that. So that also adds up. So even though, even though the plastic itself, you know, the, the levels you might get into your diet are super low, it does add up because we are exposed to so many other toxins during the day as well, mm -hmm. right? So it is, it is really a good idea to just get rid of plastic in, in a general sense and use, you know, like I use glass jars as a lunchbox when I take them to work. Um, I have a stainless steel reusable water bottle. I try not to drink from, from plastic bottles. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> Right. Now, uh, I think, Tiana, there's one last question on there as well. I saw that, Taryn. Yeah. Nice little comment there. <laughs> as um, well, it is a bit scary, but what's that last question we have there, T? Yeah, so there's a lot of discussion in the chat around the confusion of biodegradable plastic. Yeah. So can you uh, clear some confusion up for us? Yeah, I'll have a quick look. Any specific bio, blah, 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 blah. Aha, uh -huh, yes. Mm -hmm. So that's in, in, in the, there's a lot of confusion about degradable, biodegradable, oxo-biodegradable. Okay, so biodegradable. Ah. <laughs> so there is a biodegradable, technically biodegradable, bio means life, degradable means it degrades, it breaks down. Yeah, so biodegradable technically means that something is being broken down by living things, in this case, microbes. So for example, uh, a bunch of eucalyptus leaves are fully biodegradable. They are being broken down by bacteria and, and other microorganisms that do that for us. Now, plastic is a umbrella term for a whole bunch of products that are made from different chemicals. Sometimes plastics are made from starch or from sugar cane or from soybeans, right? So technically speaking, if plastics are made from that, it means that they're made from organic components and they can properly biodegrade. Now, the problem with biodegradable is that that term is not legally defined. So for example, if you, if you are an egg farmer and you want to, put, you want to produce organic eggs, you have to earn the right to put organic on your eggs to sell them. You cannot use that term under the law unless you comply with a set of requirements first. Biodegradable does not have that law behind it. So any plastic factory can say, oh, this is biodegradable uh, because, um, for example, we have built in into the molecule 
uh, one little bond of nitrogen where the bacteria can cut it and then it's gone, but it doesn't work like that, right? So biodegradable, you need to look at the actual material that the plastic is made of. If it's things like polyethylene or polypropylene, that's, that's not biodegradable, man. That's, that's all plastic that doesn't, doesn't biodegrade. So uh, if it doesn't get broken down by microbes, it's not biodegradable. Another thing that you'll see on plastic bags is degradable plastic bags. They just put that on there to, to lure you into a false sense of security because degradable, that just means it breaks into smaller pieces. Doesn't mean that it's safe, it just breaks into smaller pieces. Yeah, of course a plastic bag breaks into smaller pieces, right? Of course it's degradable, but it doesn't mean it's biodegradable, right? It's still plastic, still plastic molecules in the environment. Um, yeah, so, so that is the difference with that. So, and also another thing about biodegradable that you need to remember is that even though a plastic bag might be made out of soybeans or starch or potatoes or whatever, it still behaves like a plastic bag in the environment. So if the sea turtle swallows a biodegradable plastic bag, it's still going to get killed because the biodegradable does not work in the oceans because there is not the right bacteria to break it down in the oceans, right? So even though a plastic bag might be biodegradable, it still behaves and lasts like a normal plastic bag in the environment and poses the same threat to wildlife. Right? So this is why we need to move away from using plastic bags in the first place, no matter if they are biodegradable or not. We need to avoid them um, so they can't get out into the environment and wreak havoc. So I, I hope that that makes sense. Yeah, it does. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Sam, for not only <laughs> answering our questions, but also your entire presentation. Definitely gives a great introduction to the, the Ocean Youth Pod about single-use plastics especially and what we can do to stop using them or at least reduce using as much single-use plastic. Yeah, that's right. And you, you have that power, you know, even as young people, you might not be able to vote yet, uh, but you, your choices have a big effect in the world, on your community and on the environment Ooh. as well. So, so find out where your power lies and, and use that power, right? Amazing. And on behalf of us too, thank you so much to Popular Beaker Centre for all the work they did getting the plastic bag ban passed in 2018. Because there were so many voices and nowhere to really channel it for a while. And you guys really helped with that side. Well, of it we, were, we, were, we were part of a coalition. Mm -hmm. So it was Plastic Bag Free Victoria, who was a coalition that had, has over 90 organizations like the Eco Center signing up, uh, you know, to, to support that. So it was definitely not just the Eco Center. And this is another thing that's important. Environmental work like this, we cannot do this by ourselves. We have to work together. All the organizations have to work together towards that same goal. And then we really get things done. Yeah. Amazing, and that's why we get you lovely presenters in here to chat to our Ocean Youth kids so that you guys get an idea of all of the community that is out there that is working towards these common goals. So a big thank you, fam. Thank you for thank joining you us. So I know you have to head me. off. Yeah. That was a great way to start our Saturday morning. So thank you. And um, if there's any more questions from everyone, I might send forward them through to you later in the week yes. if you don't mind. That's totally fine. So guys, if you have any more questions about this, um, mm -hmm. Visit the EcoCenter website, ecocenter.com, and have a look. There's lots of resources there. Uh, if you have any questions that cannot be answered by doing a Google search, email me at pum at ecocenter.com, and I'm happy for you guys to put that in the email as well. And uh, Thank yeah, you. so ask me any ask ask me anything basically, because you know there's so many questions around plastic, and I, I just I could talk about it forever. <laughs> so many things. Um, yeah. Well, we could listen to you forever. I was having a great time getting all that information. So thank you so much. We'll let you head off. Everyone can wave goodbye to Fam. Thanks, Fam. See you, everyone. We'll thank you, you so much for coming. And see you, Matilde. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Now, we are going to hand over to um, Matilde in a second. But if anyone wants to go have a break for one or two minutes, if anyone needs to get a snack or a drink or a toilet break or their reusable water bottle, go and grab that at the moment. Um, and we will be handing over, what is it, 10.50? We might start at 10.52 with Matilde um, from Tangaroa Blue. So Taryn's being summoned by his mother. So he's going to head off and see her for a second. Um, <laughs> that's good. But that was really interesting for everyone who's staying around. I learned a whole heap and I've worked with Port Phillip Eco Centre 
for years and I'm still learning stuff every single day. So the importance of communication and chatting um, just shows up in those moments, doesn't it, T? Yeah. Also the confusion, there's so much confusion surrounding the issue, like uh, mm. the chat by the grade rule, what is it? The labelling. All these terms. Yeah. A lot of greenwashing, people taking advantage of like consumers trying to do the good thing and instead just creating more things in the market that we buy that never go away. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. Just um, commented about how the supermarkets took, about, took away those thin plastic bags, but they've just replaced them with those thicker plastic bags. Mm -hmm. Doesn't yeah. make too much sense, but that's why we bring our own bags with us, don't we? That's it. Yeah. That's why we love our reusable bags. Or try and carry everything at once when you forget your bag. <laughs> I've done that a few times. <laughs> That's me most of the time. I'm that person that's like, I'm only going to do one trip to the car. <laughs> Energy saving for my own body. Yeah. One trip. Usually <laughs> drop been, everything, which is not good. See that now, before, there's like Mithil, a you, um, Mithil, are you able to share your screen? Yeah, I can. Yeah. Sorry, go, go, go. Oh no, I just saw something you have so an orangutan cute. that's like, it's got the caption like when you forget to bring your reusable bag to the shops and the orangutan has like <laughs> 20 oranges amongst its body, like in its hands, <laughs> in its feet, in its mouth, in its neck. <laughs> that's me. I'll send you guys a photo next time I'm attempting to do it. <laughs> <laughs> it's not good. Now, have we got everyone back? Taryn, you're back. I can see that. I think everyone else is back as well. So what we might do, we've been lucky enough to have Matilda stick around and listen to what FAM had to say. Um, but a lot of the time, organisations like Port Phillip Eco, um, a lot of smaller community groups work with Tangaroa Blue, who um, Matilda is representing today as well. So um, she'll be able to share probably um, more knowledge than FAM on a bigger scale outside of Port Phillip Bay, um, on a larger scale, what Tangaroa Blue have been doing around Australia recently. And I think you might have a little bit of a workshop for our kids as well. Is that right, Matilda? It, today, I've actually, I changed it a little bit because I was a little bit concerned about um, just the time and not being in the mm -hmm. same room. Yes, yeah, so I've got a couple of questions and stuff, but um, yeah, I was like, oh, I don't know if the workshop will work so well without being <laughs> Thanks, so. That's all right. We can well, we've got that chat box still for everyone to write into yeah. if they want to. We can try um, and run the, the workshop later in the year when we face find to get face. Yeah. Yeah. It's, we can it's try that. Out. Weird technology. Yeah. <laughs> so strange. Well, I might hand it over to you now if you're ready to go, Matilda. And I'm going to put yeah. myself on mute again because it's getting really, really loud in here. But yeah, I am here. Good. And I'm managing the chat if anyone wants to continue writing their questions in there. But otherwise, we'll hand it over to you. Thank you. Thanks so much. And that was such a great presentation by FAM. And as you guys said, like, I've, I've been working in this space for quite a while now. And even I was like taking notes, like, oh, I, <laughs> I didn't know that. She just said that so eloquently and explained it so well. Um, so my name is Matilde Gordon and um, I work for the Tongue Royal Blue Foundation. I've been a volunteer for them for a while now. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about what we do at the Tongue Royal Blue Foundation, the Australian Marine Debris Initiative um, that we run and the people that are involved in that and just some of the results that we've found over the years and some things um, that we can do in our personal lives and also to change other people's behaviours and thoughts on, on littering and and debris um, in a nutshell. So a little bit about me um, to start off with. I've had the privilege of being able to live by the ocean my entire life in different parts of Australia, um, but always have been next to the sea. I've spent a lot of time, uh, most of my most of my time living in Cairns, where I studied zoology and ecology. Um, I actually was going to study marine biology, but it was the prospect of moving to Townsville that deterred me, <laughs> which is quite funny. Um, spent a lot of my childhood outdoors, camping, um, surfing, and just basically splashing around in, in, in nature. Um, and so basically when I did my zoology and ecology degree though, I realized, <laughs> I know, Townsville's great, it's okay, <laughs> it's a good place. <laughs> um, when I was doing my zoology and ecology degree, I realized that if I wanted to protect the animals and the places that I love, I actually had to work with people <laughs> um, rather than just with 
with animals. So I actually sort of transitioned into more sustainability and working in environmental management and that kind of thing. So I helped start the sustainability club at James Cook University and we had a, a bunch of different presenters come in and one of those presenters was Haiti from Tungaroa Blue. So I did my first beach clean up up in the Daintree it would have been in 2014 and uh, it was the beach was so much more littered than I could have imagined and we were picking up bottles and thongs and bottle caps and plus bags and all kinds of things and I just I remember feeling so absolutely frustrated and angry at society for all this rubbish that was ending up on our beaches um, and the more I thought about it the more I thought well actually any of these chip packets could come could have come from me. This could be a, a bottle top off the milk bottle that I used last month or whatever else. And so I, I just reflected on that a little bit and over the years uh, decided, well, over the months following actually decided that I wanted to try and reduce my single use plastic consumption. Um, the thing that tipped me over the edge into um, living Plastic Free was actually a blog that I saw that's called Trash is for Tosses, and <laughs> which I thought was just the best name. And it's a, um, she's in a, she was in her early 20s when she started. She was a student living in New York and she basically challenged herself to see how much plastic she could um, generate in a year. And in a year she had uh, made just a jar of of plastic waste so and she had a really awesome blog on how to minimize the different things in her in her lifestyle and and so my friends and I decided we would move into a house together there were three of us and we were just gonna blanket like no single-use plastics just go cold turkey um, I wouldn't recommend that I definitely ate like mashed potatoes for about three months straight because I was like what can I eat <laughs> um, but it was a really awesome experience looking back on it. And now it, I've been single use plastic free for four full years, just over four years. Um, occasionally, obviously there are mistakes that happen. Like you might order a drink without a straw and it comes out with two for some reason and a little plastic umbrella, or you know, you buy a soy sauce bottle and it comes with a little plastic tab on the inside. But for the most part, um, I, my partner and I live single use plastic free now and it don't even really think about it anymore. So if you have any questions on that later, feel free to hit me up. <laughs> um, so this kind of volunteer work with Tungaroa Blue, which I continue to do after the sustainability club has actually led me to meet some really amazing people, uh, experience some great opportunities, um, feel empowered by what's happening around me and also visit really awesome remote uh, places around Australia and different parts of the world. It also led to, in some sense, to a really amazing trip, which I just want to talk about briefly before going into um, Tangaroa Blue. Um, my friend and I, this is one of the friends that went single use plastic free with me four years ago. We decided to do a three month kayaking expedition um, from Juneau in Alaska down to the bottom of Vancouver Island in Canada. And we wanted to do this trip for fun, uh, but we also decided because we're really passionate about marine debris and ocean conservation that we wanted to raise awareness of the issue and raise funds for organisations who um, were doing something about it. So we campaigned and planned for our trip for two years before doing the three month expedition. And during that time and the three months, we fundraised $20,000 and half of that went to Tongaroa Blue and half of that went to the, a similar organisation called the Living Oceans Society over in, in Canada. Um, along the trip, we did presentations at schools and aquariums and um, random cafes on the coast. And sometimes we'd rock up at a random like fishing coastal town in Alaska and they'd be like, oh, we're having a potluck dinner. Can you come and talk about your trip? I'm like, yeah, that sounds great. <laughs> um, it was incredible. I don't know if anyone's been to that part of the world. Please pop it in the chat if you have. I'd love to hear if you have. Um, but the inside passage is what, is what it's called, is just scattered with thousands upon thousands of islands. And there's just so much marine wildlife, it's insane. Like it took 89 days and we saw a whale, like at least one whale 
every single day, mostly humpback whales. Um, we also saw orca, there were otters, um, sea lions that would kind of intimidate us and swim towards our kayaks. Uh, we saw 18 bears, 16 of those were grizzly bears. Um, it was just like a zoologist an adventurer's dream. Um, so if you ever get the chance to go to that part of the world, it doesn't have to be a three month kayaking expedition, but I would highly recommend it if you have that opportunity. Um, so yeah, one of the major things that we wanted to do on the trip was because we've been living single use plastic free at home, we wanted to see if we could do an adventure without single use plastics. Now, um, if anyone's been hiked on a long, um, long hiking trip or canoeing or kayaking trip, yeah, a couple of people nodding their heads there. Um, before I went plastic free, honestly, I wouldn't even have thought twice about using hundreds of Ziploc plastic bags to store my food. So a lot of the time I would actually dehydrate meals um, with my family or friends and put each individual meal in a Ziploc bag that was labeled for that day because it just makes things look so much easier. So we thought, okay, one of the biggest things to reducing our single use plastic use on this kayaking trip is going to be our food, because we have to have 300 meals between the two of us, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and snacks. Um, so by the way, we did trial this at home in Australia before going to Canada. It was not like a last minute decision. Uh, but what we did is we did our regular plastic free shopping at fruit and veg markets. We um, cooked up the meals, in crock pots with the help of an amazing cafe that sponsored us and helped us cook meals which is great. Lucy and I are both what we call um, foodies. We like eating things but I, I actually don't like cooking at all so that was like a lifesaver for us and then we dehydrated those meals um, and we wrapped them in first of all a layer of just upcycled butcher's paper and then a couple of layers of newspaper. We didn't want the ink from the newspaper to go into our food. So we wrapped that up into parcels, put it into dry bags, and we um, stored those dry bags in our kayaks. We separated the three month trip into 10 days to two week legs. Um, so we actually sent away our resupply boxes with the next round of food, which would pick up in the towns along the way. One of the most stressful parts of the expedition actually was we had to, in Vancouver, we had to send off our food up into Alaska. There's a little town just south of the border that is America, um, well it is America, and it makes it a lot cheaper to send your food up to Alaska. It's like $50 a box instead of $500 a box. And it wasn't until that we were driving towards the border to go through security, um, like probably what an hour away, and we had like the boot full of little brown parcels of dehydrated food that Lucy and I were like, this is gonna look so dodgy. <laughs> and this, I just wanna clarify, this was like a day before flying up to Alaska. So this was like, if they, took away our food, it would have been a total disaster. But thankfully they were all in a really good mood and um, it was fine. We smuggled our food across the border <laughs> legally. <laughs> so that's just a little bit about what some exciting things that working in the, and volunteering in this space has uh, led me to be able to do. So just a little bit about Tangaroa Blue. Um, people often ask where the heck that name comes from. <laughs> um, Tangaroa is actually a Polynesian god of the sea. And his mantra is, if you look after me, I'll look after you, which um, is very true and very real. If we look after the oceans, then they'll look after us. We need the oceans to survive. <laughs> um, and Tangaroa Blue's motto is, if all we do is clean up, that's all we'll ever do. And I'll go into that a little bit more later. But basically, we run beach cleanups and river cleanups uh, all over Australia. And we... Um, have volunteers come to all those cleanups. We also run education events, um, come into presentations like this one, run workshops and things like that. So um, yeah, we're doing quite a bit around Australia. We've been, we started in 2004, so we've been around for 16 years now. Um, I just wanted to chat quickly about marine debris. Um, Fam did chat about this, so I'm not gonna go into it in too much depth because we just discussed it, but could people put in the chat um, what they th think the definition of marine debris is? 
Oh, actually, damn it, I screwed up the presentation and just put it there, so we'll just skip that question. <laughs> Fail. <laughs> that was meant to be like something that came up afterwards, but anyway, moving on. So marine debris is man-made items that end up in our oceans. It's not just plastics, it's anything that's man-made. So we also find lots of treated wood, uh, metal, ropes that aren't necessarily synthetic, that kind of thing that ends up in our oceans. Um, it's basically anything that's not meant to be there. <laughs> Pham was talking about this and the fact that plastic doesn't actually break down, it breaks up. And I really encourage you to, to when you're talking about plastic and marine debris with your friends and family, to accentuate that point. Because people really think that when it's out of sight, out of mind and we don't have to worry about it but it actually becomes such a bigger problem once it's in tiny small pieces even if you just think of the analogy of the difference between picking up one milk bottle off the beach compared to picking it up once it's broken down into like 18 million pieces obviously it requires a lot more energy time and it pretty much becomes um, impossible now plastic is an incredible invention you have to admit uh, um, it's resistant to so many different things. It's, uh, it's not flammable. It lasts such a long time. It's lightweight, it's durable. It's led to some incredible advances in, for example, medical technology. And it, when it first was invented, you know, and a couple and a decade or a couple of decades after that, it revolutionized um, really what people, how much time people had to spend on looking after their food or their houses and things like that, because you had some, you had a product that was so durable, could be cleaned so easily. So you have to give it a little bit of credit, <laughs> but it is the fact that, you know, we've taken it way, 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 way too far. Um, so Pham did talk about the fact that everything that has ever been created still exists on this planet today. And that also just completely blows my mind. So why do we care about it? Um, I'm not gonna go into this because Pham did, but basically entanglement, ingestion, over 96% of all biodiversity actually potentially ingests plastic. That photo of the bird in the bottom right corner um, has come from Lord Howe Island, an island halfway between Sydney and um, New Zealand. And what they found on that island is that I think it was over 80% of the birds that they looked at um, that had died had plastics inside of them. And you can see that is a phenomenal amount of plastic in that bird's stomach. Like that's not just a couple of little pieces. So, and as we heard, it travels up the food chain and ends up on our plates. Um, plastics can also cause a lot of economic loss when they're in the ocean in terms of tourism. People don't want to go to places that are um, covered in plastic. We're also damaged to vessels, um, especially shipping containers bobbing around in the ocean. Uh, they're a massive hazard for, for boats. Um, potentially running into them and things like that. Obviously we care more about the animals and the environmental, the habitat in the ocean, but it is important to talk about it from a money perspective because money talks. Um, sometimes that's what gets people people's attention a little bit more. So lots of issues. <laughs> um, so what is the Australian Marine Debris Initiative? So it's a nationwide framework addressing marine debris via data collection, essentially. And it involves a network of communities, uh, schools, industries, government agencies, groups um, that contribute to the AMDI and help make it what it is. We have over 1,500 uh, organisations and partners that contribute into the Marine Debris Initiative, and that's increasing every year. Um, so what we do when we do our cleanups is we not just take it off the beach, but we also sort the debris meticulously. Has anyone here been to a Tongaroa Blue cleanup? If you have, just pop it in the chat. Um, we do operate a little bit more up in Queensland than we do in other parts of Australia, but that's changing. Um, so we sort the debris for someone who loves being like very organized and things like that. I actually love the sorting phase. I'm kind of a weirdo when it comes to data collection. Um, my partner hates it. He avoids it at all costs. He'll do any other 
task on the beach to avoid being at the sorting station. Um, but we sort the debris basically into different material types. So um, plastic would be a major one. And then we separate that into following categories. So it could be consumer items. Then consumer items would be separated into straws, cutlery, a cigarette butts, and heaps of other different categories. Um, Plastic packaging will be separated into food packaging, but also non-food packaging, um, like other different products, cleaning products and stuff like that. So it's all sorted and it's all collected on a little machine there. There's actually now an app that you can enter it onto, which I'm gonna talk about in a second. Um, over the past 16 years, we've actually had over 16 million pieces of data entered into the um, database. So all of the data collected from this cleanup goes into the database. Um, that database is open access. Anyone can, can have access to it, which is really exciting. Um, it's then analyzed and, and we can trace it. You can use that analysis to try and trace it back to the source as much as possible. Now that doesn't mean necessarily going, okay, we found this, McDonald's straw and it comes from like Elizabeth Street and CBD or whatever else um, but it we can have a general idea of where whether it's coming from the land whether it's coming from the ocean as in overseas or a fishing vessel or you know for in a certain location and we're finding a number of coffee cups that have a, um, a label on them from a local cafe we can trace it back to something um, that's very specific uh, I should also mention that on our remote cleanups in particular, we do find a lot of international debris. We actually take down the barcodes and the labels of, of the bottles and things that we find. And that has led to some really awesome discoveries, which I'll chat about in a second. Oops, sorry. Once we have traced it back to the source as much as possible, we then turn that information into source reduction plans. That source reduction plans could be source, sorry, source reduction plans, sorry, a bit of a tongue twister, could be um, based around a particular community, like what I was talking about with those coffee, cup, coffee cups. We could meet with local organizations and groups and the cafes and say, okay, here are some of the strategies we could put in place um, to minimize this. Or it could also be on a, a larger scale, like preventing pellet loss in the plastics industry, which I'll go into in a bit of a second. So there's source reduction plans of different levels, but that data that we find is so important because without that, then people are like, well, where are the plastics? What do you mean? What are you finding? Prove it. <laughs> um, so as you all know, or I hope you know, um, if, you're not, if you don't know, I'm about to blow your mind, but Australia is surrounded by water. Uh, <laughs> we have over 3,000 coastal and river locations around Australia, um, which means there's a, a lot of the potential for the rubbish we produce to end up in our oceans, but also we're a massive target in the middle of the Pacific that um, basically acts as a little bit of a net to trap waste coming from overseas. So. People are often surprised to see actually how littered Australia's remote beaches are. Has anyone tr here travelled um, north of Cairns, for example, up in Cape York? Just pop it in the chat because I can't see everyone's face. <laughs> yeah, a couple of people. So Ava's been up there. Yeah. 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 So. That we do a couple of cleanups every single year where we go up the Cape and we might stay there for 10 days or two weeks and clean up rubbish off the beaches. Um, one of the beaches, for example, oh yeah, Broome in Western Australia, it's pretty far north. Um, one of the places we clean up is called Chili Beach and we clean up about six kilometres of the beach. And the most we've pulled up out of that particular beach has been seven or I think it was eight tons, sorry. And that was only in five days. Um, it's actually phenomenal how much we clean up, uh, how much we pick up, especially in the northern remote parts of Australia, even though there's, you know, there's a lot of indigenous communities up there. But other than that, there's not a lot of people that live up there. So it's really interesting to see the different types of marine debris that we find. Basically, the further north you go, over 80% of the marine debris that we find comes from overseas or comes from the ocean. 
So that could be, um, you know, large items, hard plastic items, thousands of rubber thongs, an unimaginable amount of plastic toothbrushes for some reason, um, a lot of fishing gear like ropes um, and things like that. And as you head further south, it, it, the ratio switches and it actually becomes more a uh, higher percentage of rubbish coming from the land. You find more things like wrappers, bottles, takeaway containers, straws, the things that we you know use every day um, and so many cigarette butts as well. So in the bottom right hand corner that's one of our staff Vanessa sitting in a pile of bottles that we picked up probably off off Chile Beach or somewhere like that. Um, and yeah, on the left, you can see the number of cigarette butts picked up in a tiny little space. So we can have, a, we have a very clear picture of the types of marine debris that we find um, around Australia. And we know that 75% of the marine debris that we find in Australia is plastic. So that's where we concentrate a lot of our efforts into um, rather than the other types of marine debris. It comes from all different kinds of sources. As I've talked about a little bit, it can come from people purposefully littering, um, flushing things down the toilet for some reason. It could come from people trying to do the right thing, putting their rubbish in a bin, but then it overflows because it's not picked up or you know it's really windy or whatever else. Um, industries purposefully or accidentally polluting into the environment. Uh, ending up in the drains and then just straight out into our river and ocean systems. It also comes from, you know, fishing and boaters in general accidentally or purposefully letting things overboard. Um, as someone who is getting into sailing and that kind of thing, I'm starting to understand how hard it can be to actually tie things down properly. Um, you know, you think you've got everything under control and suddenly you're like, okay, that, that you know, gas canister just fell overboard. Um, a lot of the time people aren't doing this on purpose. It's a harsh, tricky environment to navigate through. And so accidents do happen. Um, I don't know if any of you heard about it, but a couple of weeks ago, um, uh, oh, how many, there's over 30 uh, shipping containers fell off um, a ship off the coast of Sydney and thousands, hundreds of thousands of um, Coles branded takeaway, plastic takeaway containers and masks ended up on the beaches all up and down Sydney. Um, it does happen, this accidental loss of debris. And due to the fact that it does come from so many different sources, this makes it quite a complex problem. There's no blanket solution to, to deal with this, right? I also like to include this map um, in here, which just goes, it shows it shows the uh, countries in white and the oceans in blue, and it just shows how interconnected all of our oceans are. With marine debris, talking to a lot of people about plastics and marine debris over the years and around the world, um, people often like to point the finger towards other countries or other people or whatever else and say, you know, it's, it's not my fault. I personally am not a litterer, so then it's not my problem. I don't have to deal with it. But it is everyone's problem and it is everyone's responsibility. Uh, a lot of people, for example, like to point the finger at developing countries or, for example, countries in, in Southeast Asia, say it all comes from there. Uh, the reality is, uh, I don't know if people know this, but up until 2018, Australia and Canada and the USA sent most of our recycling overseas. So we sent it over to, to, to Thailand, we sent it to, back to China, we sent it back to Indonesia. And in 2018, all these, all these countries were like, well, actually, we don't want to deal with your waste anymore. So now we're having a bit of a problem trying to catch up with our own waste. Um, Australia is just as bad when it comes to waste production. Uh, we're just better at hiding it. But really, we should be at the forefront of technology and um, solutions to dealing with our waste because we we have the money for it. <laughs> we can we can develop strategies and we can be a good example for other countries. But yeah, I just like that map because you don't often see the oceans like that. As as Fam uh, said, plastic production is set to increase over the last um, the next few decades. Sorry. And so that just proves and uh, accentuates the fact that we need to stop it at the source because if we keep waiting it for, to get it in the oceans, um, to pick it up from the oceans in our rivers, then it's just going to be way too much and impossible. 
So back to the AMDI app. This is an app that you can actually download um, on your own device and enter information into. Anyone can enter data into this app. It is screened and, and checked for quality before it goes up there. Um, and the information that we can find with people who enter the data into this app is basically the types of litter, um, what it's made out of, plastic, metal, glass, rubber, etc. The systems and environments that it comes from, whether it's a river, a beach, a remote area, a wetland or a park. We can then look at what activities are happening in the area. So for example, we can have an indication of the type of pollution. So um, does it come from illegal dumping? Does it come from people littering? Is it potentially accidental? Is it being washed in as is the case up in Chile Beach? Can I have, also have a look at the human activity in the area? Like is there fishing, boating, camping, uh, full driving? Uh, is it the CBD <laughs> of a city? And then from there, we can develop source reduction plans uh, and, and focus our resources and money and time, energy on the areas that need it the most. So definitely check out the app. We actually have a lot of really great videos on our website now on how to use it and how to enter data. And um, we need you. <laughs> um, an example of a, a, a large scale source reduction plan is Operation Clean Sweep. And I believe you heard about this from Haiti last year. So I'm just gonna give you a little bit of an update. Um, some of you might've heard about this. Uh, this program was introduced into the USA in 1992 and has since been introduced into 22 other different jurisdictions, including Australia. The aim of it, of the project is to, basically our goal is zero pellet loss. Pellets, or they're also called nurdles, which is, I, in my opinion, more fun to say. Um, <laughs> so nurdles are basically like that raw material that's then melted down and molded into whatever we then want it to be. And they do unfortunately end up in our environment in vast quantities uh, all over the world. So this program was introduced into Australia a couple of years ago and we are encouraging companies, manufacturers, uh, transport companies and producers to sign up to this program and then put in place some different uh, strategies to reduce or entirely eliminate pollution. So that might be some really simple things like recycling or disposing of any extra pellets properly. Um, or when a truck comes in full of nurdles, um, instead of just hosing it down into the drain, you know, actually vacuuming it up or sweeping it up and putting it in a bin, containing spills rather than just going, oh, okay, oopsie daisies and moving on. Um, and the exciting thing is that uh, a lot of companies that want to be on board with this because they want to be seen doing the right thing, right? And in, at the start of March, we actually had Chemistry Australia, which is the largest plastic industry body in Australia. They signed up and formally adopted the program at the National Plastic Summit in Parliament um, in March in Canberra. So that is really, really exciting um, news. Those images that you see on the right there are from the last couple of months, I've been sorting through drain samples out of Port Phillip Bay that's come from your neck of the woods. And I've been going through dirt basically and pulling out all the nurdles and other shavings out of it. Um, you can see there on the scale, it says 300, about 330 grams. That was pulled out of a bag of dirt and plastics. It was about a kilo. So um, a third of what was trapped in the drain was actually nurdles and microplastics. I'm so glad that program's done. I dreamt about nurdles for months, <laughs> counting, counting them every single day. So what do we need to do to stop the release? Um, obviously we need to change um, our behaviors, individual behaviors on a, on a local level. There's also a lot of changes that we need to make to legislation. And that is where the data collection comes in, as Fan was talking about before. We can't change those higher up levels of legislation unless we have evidence um, of what we're finding, where it's coming from, um, and also showing progress over time. People love to hear progress stories, right? So um, there are a few different levels that we need to change in this issue. 
um, I did want to chat about litterers and and the littering aspect of thing because um, like I said before people do like to point the finger um, and say you know oh it's all about those you know litterers whatever else we need to deal with them but litterers aren't a specific target group of people uh, littering depends entirely on on the context that it's in um, you can't just you can't just look at someone and and assume or say that they're a litterer because it happens to everyone. I mean, every single person here has accidentally or purposefully littered at some point in their lives. Like, absolutely. I I mean, put, I'd like to hear in the chat actually. So, who has thrown an apple core out the window of a car or um, just walking along after you've eaten an apple, for example? I have. <laughs> Has anyone else thrown an apple out the window? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, a couple of people. Um, has anybody thrown a cigarette or a um, Macca's cup out of the window? You have to be quite brave to admit to this, but. <laughs> okay, hopefully not, but you know, that what I just wanted to show there is that it, it completely depends on the contacts. <laughs> Mum would strangle me. <laughs> yeah, it completely depends on the context. So we can't just blanket solution and, and blanket say, you know, it's, it's litterer's problem and we have to deal with it from that perspective. Um, we have to look at it, the situation, what's around us. So in terms of developing strategies to minimize littering, uh, there's a few there's a few strategies that we know work. So one of them, for example, is creating um, a commitment or a pledge. Can anyone think of a pledge that is happening at the moment that is a commitment to um, reduce single-use plastics? <laughs> so we obviously have, as Fan was talking about before, Plastic Free July. This is why. Um, online presentations are so awkward to me. I like. I just want to be like in front of people. <laughs> it's like that lag. Anyway, so commitments are great because people pledge and are held accountable for for that pledge and that commitment. Right. When Lucy and I said we were going to a three month hiking expedition without single use plastics, um, we announced it to all of our friends and family. We started a fundraiser and then we were like, well. <laughs> Now we definitely have to do it <laughs> um, because everyone's watching us and it does work. It works really well. So commitments um, are an effective way of getting people to reduce plastics and not litter. Um, also, when we look at social norms, we need to switch the social norm around. For example, something like cigarette butts. Um, I mean, think of all the films that you've seen, even just Leonardo DiCaprio in acting as his really cool character because he's always really cool, uh, finishing off a cigarette and then flicking it onto the ground. That kind of subconscious messaging has been uh, thrown at us for years. And, and you, you often see smokers throwing cigarette butts onto the ground. A lot of smokers don't realize that butts are made out of plastic. But also a lot of people see the behavior in other people and they, they emulate that behavior. They do the same thing because it's a social norm. So switching that social norm around is, is super important. <laughs> Damn it, Leo. Yeah, we need to, we need to speak to Hollywood. <laughs> um, so that you can see in the bottom left corner there, there's uh, a poster about people leaving their dog poo bags after a walk. So instead of saying one out of every 10 people litters, uh, leaves a dog poo bag behind, that poster says nine out of every 10 dog owners do the right thing. And that has the really creepy eyes there. So what it's done is it's actually created a space where it said, okay, the majority of people um, are actually good with their dog waste and you're the one that's not doing the right thing. And that switches the social norm around. So we know that that works. Um, so, so yeah, social diffusion is talking about the diffusion of a responsibility. So some of us might have um, gone to a festival where we've seen at the end of the festival, everyone's left their tents, their eskies, their bottles, whatever else lying around a campsite because 
they can see that everyone else is, is doing the same thing. So that's basically diffusing our responsibility over everyone um, at the festival. And that happens in things like parks, on beaches. If a place is messy before we even get there, people tend to just add to it because that's just what's happening. Um, so making sure that there's no social diffusion and that you know we, we take care of our rubbish um, and, and we take responsibility for that trash and actually take action to be that first person to clean it up is really important. Um, prompts are a big one. Signage like the I'm a beach, not an enormous ashtray, they work really well. Other forms of effective communication when it comes to reducing plastics is um, funny memes and games and artwork, so gamifying things. There's a couple of um, ashtrays that you'll see in Victoria and also in Queensland where they've asked like a question. And so when you finish smoking, you can either put, you know, yes, or you can put your, your cigarette butt into the no category. So gamifying things ha helps people a lot <laughs> in getting rid of their rubbish and creating incentives like the container deposit scheme where people can make money from taking care of their trash works really well, as well as convenience. If there's no bin around in a park, then people aren't going to walk, um, you know, a couple of kilometres to put something in the bin. So that's a major issue. Making sure it's convenient for people is, is really important. Okay, I'm talking too much. I'm just going to skip through a couple here. <laughs> I'm like, fam, I'm like, yeah, I can talk about this for a while. Um, so this is the container deposit scheme, turning rubbish into money. And obviously the plastic bag ban in Victoria, which was a massive win in 2018. And we have collect, it's now happening in Queensland as well. And we have seen a dramatic reduction in the amount of plastic bags that we find in our rivers and oceans. So it, um, it has definitely made, made a difference. Uh, I just love this because it makes you laugh, right? Like if you saw this giant squishy cigarette butt in the street, um, it would definitely make you think about what the heck's going on. So uh, that's a form of, you know, funny communication that's going to get the message across <laughs> to people. And kudos to that person who dressed up as a cigarette butt and lay on the ground, the streets of Melbourne, I think it was. <laughs> so in terms of what we can do as an individual, because as Fam was saying, you know, the one thing you do have control over is your own, own behaviour. Um, we can refuse and reduce the con our consumption of single-use plastics. Um, things like taking your own reusable water bottle, shopping in bulk, um, taking your own container for takeaway and things like that. Um, one thing that really helps Lucy and my friend Kelsey and I when we went single-use plastic free was actually doing an audit of our home. Uh, it could also be a workplace or a classroom, but we did an order of the bathroom and the kitchen because we thought we were pretty, you know, environmentally conscious, but we wanted to see what was there, what plastics we did have. And it was actually really surprising and shocking to see how much was there. From that order, we then decided on what we could replace. And if you are to do this uh, for the start of Plastic Free July, for example, is a really good time to do it. I would recommend changing you know, three things and sticking to three things for the month of July, rather than doing a blanket, get rid of everything, single use plastic in the house. Um, picking three things. The thing about Plastic Free July and the basis of it is that it actually, studies have shown that it takes one month to uh, change a habit. So that's why they get people to make the pledge for one month, because at the end of it, it becomes a habit and you don't even think about it anymore. Um, so doing an audit is great. Uh, talking about the issue with friends and family and colleagues, talking about everything that you learned today with the people around you, creating that conversation. Um, when Tangaroa Blue started 16 years ago, Haiti, the CEO, would talk about marine debris at conferences and other events, and people didn't know what she was talking about. So it is important to note that you know, over the last couple of decades, the, now the average person in the street, when you talk about marine debris or plastics in the ocean, has heard of it, has heard of the gyres, has heard of that it's a problem. So we have come that far, which is a positive thing to reflect on. Now we need to take it to the next step of actual legitimate action. Another action that we can do on a personal basis is joining in on beach cleanups. If anyone does travel up 
um, Cairns or to far north Queensland or just Queensland in general, there are some really exciting cleanup opportunities coming up that will be announced on our website in the next couple of months. So check that out. We do also work down in Victoria occasionally as well, although that's not happening right now. We're staying away from you. <laughs> um, one thing we can also do is contribute data to the AMDI database. If you, for example, and your friends or family or colleagues have an area that you know is uh, polluted and you have the time to go down there, for example, um, once a month or once every three months, or even just once off, but those, Studies where we can see what happens over time are really important and valuable to us. So if you have the time to go down there, do a clean up, uh, contribute data to the AMDI, we can, we can see what's happening down there and potentially create like a source production plan around that area locally. Um, and of course, that all of that data collection and um, all of that data collection, sorry, helps to lobby government and industry and holds the people in power accountable. Um, you can also do that through petitions, writing to your local MP, that kind of thing. So it can feel an overwhelming issue and 35 minutes is very short to cover, you know, <laughs> everything that we can do to solve this problem. Um, what I like to do is remind myself that changing our personal behavior and influencing what happens locally around us does have a global impact. So it can be hard to think about, you know, changing this issue from a top level down, but knowing that you're in control of what's happening directly around you is, is really important. And I think that's, you know, encompassed in that little meme there that it's, it's just one straw, I said 7 billion people. And I quote the Lorax because the Lorax is amazing and I think everyone should listen to him more. <laughs> um, I just want to do a short little plug at the end here. Um, Lucy and I did make a short documentary on our kayaking expedition. Um, that's our website there, we called ourselves Passage Adventures. We're on Instagram and Facebook and we're actually having an online screening of our documentary on Saturday, the 18th of July at 7.30 p.m. So you can find information about that on our social media channels. Um, the film has footage of whales and us having fun, also a little bit of crying in there, I think. Um, <laughs> it also shows how we prepared for the trip without using single-use plastics, because what we wanted to show was, you know, if we could do it in an extremely wet, cramped, cold, damp environment, then perhaps people can do it at home. <laughs> um, so that was a lot of talking in a short amount of space. I really, really appreciate you guys listening. And I hope that, um, you know, we can do a, a workshop in person at some point. I'd love to meet people in the group in person. I uh, hope you learned something today. And yeah, I just want to say thanks. Thanks so much for having me. And thanks for listening, everyone. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Matilde. That was fantastic. Um, unfortunately, we have lost Peter through audio and video, but she <laughs> is still here, so she can still hear. Um, but yeah, she just can't talk or or um show her face. Um, yeah, we had some great discussions in the in the chat whilst all that was going on. Some responses to your questions. Um, one of them which I chimed in on as well. Oh, Pete's face. There we go. <laughs> was from Ava. If single use plastic is the worst of worst, is plastic containers like Tupperware reuse still bad? Thoughts? No, I wouldn't say so um, because it can be used over and over again. Like we, when we went single use plastic free, for example, we didn't throw out everything that we had that was plastic we, we gave all the things away like our shampoo bottles and stuff like that because we wanted to start afresh with shampoo bars and whatever else but if you already have those containers if you already have those Tupperware containers or whatever else keep on using them and you know especially when it comes to the single-use plastic free lifestyle when you look at it on Instagram or social media it's all beautiful mason jars and homemade beeswax wraps and all of this other stuff that has been made to look so nice and fancy and Instagram worthy, right? Um, use what you have. And that's why I really liked Trashes for Tosses. And there's some other great examples out there because it's students, it's university students that are time poor, money poor, and they're just using what they have around them. 
Um, it doesn't have to be a fancy, beautiful, reusable mug. It doesn't have to be a metal takeaway container. Use what's there. Um, I personally am kind of obsessed with op shops. Um, and so like even now on the boat, on the sailboat, we can't store everything in glass because if something, you know, if the boat gets knocked over, then suddenly everything's broken and it's a disaster. Um, so I've been going and getting reusable takeaway, I mean, sorry, reusable Tupperware containers from the op shop, for example, and using that. So if it's already in existence, I'd say go for it. Um, buying new ones, probably not as necessary, but if you're going to use it over and over again, it's definitely better than, you know, just taking using one takeaway container and throwing it out after 12 seconds or whatever the average was, 12 minutes. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, I've also just mentioned that in my own home, we've just started buying these little glass kind of lunch containers from Kmart and Ikea sell them too. They're really cheap. So if you don't have any Tupperware and you're looking to build up a, a Tupperware portfolio, um, definitely have a look at Kmart, Ikea. There's so many places that sell them really cheap. Mine has a plastic lid that clips on and yeah. a silicon rim, but they do also have bamboo if you want to go completely plastic free as well. So there are yeah. options out there. Yeah, and finding something that seals is important as well. Like I find like there's so many containers people go through because they don't want the plastic lid or the plastic seal, but then they end up having to buy more because they're like, oh, well, now my curry is everywhere in my bag. <laughs> exactly. Um, I do have a question for you, Mathilde. What did you find was the hardest single-use plastic to give up, something that you really had to search for an alternative for? Yeah, well, I would say, actually, it's just getting used to not... I'd say it's just getting used to not being able to buy whatever you want whenever you want it. Um, so it wasn't like a particular item, but for example, you know, someone invites you to go over to their place and bring snacks. You can't just go to the shop and get a pack of the Doritos and whatever else, you know, you have to think in advance and be a bit more prepared in that area. So when I first went single use plastic free, it was a lot of like, oh, I can't just go in and buy a Magnum ice cream or a pack of the chips or whatever else. And at first it was really frustrating, but over time I realized, well, actually I'm eating so much healthier now because a lot of the single use plastic items that we find in the shops, um, the packaging is used for junk food and things that, you know, convenient things that we want to just like shove in our mouths, um, whatever else. So it, yeah, I, I found it hard at first, but other than that, like, I really can't tell you anything that I miss. You know, it's just getting used to, okay, where do I shop that where I can get items without single use plastic around them. And so one thing that's tough is traveling, which um, none of us are doing right now. So, uh, <laughs> but yeah, traveling to a new, a different country or even a different city or a different town and not having your regular kind of shopping spaces around you can be quite difficult. Yeah. Beautiful. Uh, any more questions in the chat? Anyone else got more questions for Matilda? <laughs> it's been a long morning. <laughs> I'm so impressed by people. <laughs> Maybe about her adventure, if you have heard enough about plastics. <laughs> Everyone's like, no, we're all tired, I think. Yeah, I'm ready to start my day. day. <laughs> It's a big ask to get teenagers out of bed before 10, so we've well, done I'm, I'm so impressed. I never did this, so. Um, but, yeah, if anyone's interested in that screening, it would be awesome to have people come along to that and we can fill our virtual theatre with um, people watching the documentary. But other than that, yeah, if no one has any questions, um, thanks so much for listening. <laughs> Beautiful. Um, now, Peter will or help me organise a um, after, what do we call it, Peter? A chase-up email? Follow-up email. <laughs> Beautiful. Um, and we will definitely link the website below so you can all join in and watch that. I know me and Peter will definitely virtually be there because I'm really excited to see some bears and whales. Um, <laughs> And hopefully our ocean youthers join us as well. But thank you so much from both Peter and I and all the kids who will join us today. We've really enjoyed listening to your story and how hopefully it inspires them to use a little less single-use plastics. What do you think? Yeah? <laughs> yeah, take it, you know, seeing what you can do um, 
without putting yourself out, you know, you want to, you want to just see what you can accomplish in, in the time and resources that you have. And people, you know, you can't just go up to your friends and family and tell people that they're killing turtles. People will change their behaviors and their thoughts because they see you um, as a regular member in society, still functioning and doing all the things that normal people do. You're just not using single use plastics and people see that and that, that's what makes them think. And that's what may, has made friends and family around us change their minds is not just listening to us rant about it, but actually just watching how easy it can be really. Yeah. Beautiful. All right. Thank you so much. We're going to say a big goodbye now to everyone. Thank you all for joining us on this cold Saturday morning. And I hope you enjoy life on the boat. That sounds so much fun. Yeah. Yeah. It's quite interesting. <laughs> Thank all you. Right. See you, everyone. See ya.